Hello, this is David Hall of the M2M Zone, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the M2M Zone webinar titled, How Low Power IoT Can Change Your Business. This webinar is sponsored by Digi International and Sigfox. Before we start, there are a few items that I would like to bring to the attention of our viewers. Today's presentation will be approximately 45 minutes long, followed by a 15-minute Q&A session with our panelists. This is an interactive webinar, so we are eager to receive your questions at any time. Just type them into the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. Our speakers will address as many of the questions as possible during the Q&A segment following the presentation. Please address your questions to all panelists, which is the default setting in the Q&A box. This presentation, the slides and recording will be archived and available for viewing later on in the events section of the M2M Zone website. Also, if anyone would like to see more detail on the slides, simply click on the Enlarge button in the upper right-hand corner. At this point, it is my pleasure to turn the session over to our moderator, Robin Duke Woolley, founder and CEO of Beecham Research. Robin has over 35 years' experience in the telecom and IT industry, firstly in commercial roles covering marketing management, sales management, and general management in international technology vendor companies, and secondly in marketing analyst analysis consulting roles. He has been researching the M2M and IoT markets since 2001 and is an internationally recognized thought leader in this area. Robin? Man, um, for private and public networks, as well as narrowband alternatives that are coming online and the opportunities these offer for businesses looking to implement IoT solutions. So this is a really important subject for uh, development of the IoT. So let me introduce you to our two speakers in turn. First of all, Brent Nelson, Senior Product Manager, Digi International. Hello, Brent. Hello, Robin. Happy to be here today. Great. And uh, Alan Proethis, who is President North America for Sigfox. Hello, Alan. Hello, Robin. Okay, gentlemen, welcome to you both. Uh, Brent has uh, over a decade of experience in wireless machine-to-machine -machine communication as a design engineer and product manager. As a cellular-focused product manager, Brent understands and constantly studies dynamics in the industrial IoT ma market. And with that knowledge, he ensures the uh, Digi uh, cellular product suite addresses top industry challenges. Uh, then Alan is the president of Sigfox North America and has an extensive background in the IoT and M2M markets, having led the development of several businesses in those spaces over the last five years. So, for example, Alan led the funding and uh, launch of Watts.io, and prior to that, he was Executive Vice President of Interdigital Solutions, where he led the creation of Convido Wireless, an M2M joint venture with Sony Interdigital and Stephen, Cap Steve Stephen Capital, and served as, a chair served as chairman. Now, I'm going to present uh, some uh, introductory slides first, uh, and then I'm going to be followed by Brent and then by Alan. And then, uh, just to remind you, there will be a Q&A session uh, at the end. Uh, you can send your questions uh, for our speakers at any time now. Just type them into the uh, Ask a Question window on your screen. Uh, and I'll put as many of those questions as possible to our speakers later in the hour. So please send uh, your questions uh, right now. Now I'm going to uh, move on to uh, my presentation uh, and uh, start that off. So uh, this is just a first initial slide to remind us that uh, we're talking about the whole of the uh, M2M IoT sector here with uh, these nine key sectors. Um, and we're talking about in typically uh, for uh, all of that, uh, all of those applications in that slide, we're talking about all connectivity uh, types, and they have they all have a part to play in IoT. So we have you know, cellular, 2G, 3G, 4G, to uh, 5G. We have Wi-Fi. We have uh, Bluetooth, Sigmi. We have fixed broadband, wireless broadband, satellite, and then we have low power wide area. Uh, otherwise known as low power IoT, uh, increasingly elements are being called mobile IoT, and then we have uh, many others as well. So uh, this slide is really just to remind us of where LPWA fits compared with some of these other wireless technologies. 
so it's up there with uh, long range uh, and uh, low data rate. So uh, it's latency tolerant uh, and has high coverage. Um, and it permits uh, low complexity and cost and low, low power, so long battery life. So this is the area that we're focusing on. And um, this introduces a whole new set of uh, application areas that uh, have traditionally not really been covered by connectivity uh, in the past. And uh, some of the um, application areas that we're talking about here, um, it's uh, sort of smart city, uh, agriculture and environment, uh, utilities, uh, industrial, uh, logistics, uh, smart building, consumer and medical. Those are probably the uh, main areas that uh, we see uh, opportunities for these types of technologies. Now, yeah, some of them are um, replacing or augmenting existing uh, applications in the marketplace, but it's primarily new applications, not addressable with uh, other available technologies. Uh, and it's essentially low cost, high volume applications. And that, of course, means that um, you know, provisioning and installation needs to be catered for in mass volumes. And that's something that uh, I think the industry really needs to uh, probably think more about. How do we get these big volumes out into the marketplace, into these types of applications, uh, in a cost-effective way, bearing in mind that they are low-cost uh, application um, opportunities? So uh, just to give an example, um, how is this complementary to traditional cellular, for example? Uh, well, we have uh, at the top, we've got a little table there of cellular versus low power wide area, where the energy requirements for uh, cellular tend to be high, and for low power wide area, it's, it's low. Uh, the range for uh, cellular at, at LP wide area are both long. Uh, data rate tends to be high for cellular, but low to medium for low power wide area. The cost of the endpoints, uh, medium to high for cellular, low for low power wide area. In-building penetration uh, for uh, cellular is uh, average to poor, whereas it's very good in uh, low power wide area. So uh, some complementary uh, characteristics there. And then the applic an application example, just to get the sort of idea of where it fits. So talking about a car park environment, um, you might have um, cellular in the uh, parking payment system and security uh, video cameras. And then you'd use um, low power wide area for uh, parking space sensors showing uh, sort of empty, vacant uh, electric vehicle charging availability and, and so forth. So it's different types of applications that work together. So we certainly don't see uh, this as being a replacement to uh, existing applications. We see them as being complementary and adding new uh, opportunities. Now, Vitrum Research has uh, created a new uh, sector map for uh, these types of applications. It's sort of, uh, so I introduced the um, uh, sector map at the beginning, which is for the whole of the uh, IoT market. And this is like a layer that sits underneath that. So it's low power, wide area, service application, uh, service applications layer. Um, and yeah, there are uh, opportunities in all of the segments that, uh, that we cover in the, in the sector map. So this is just a visualization that it's a, it's a, it's a sub-layer. And of course, there's another layer for cellular, and there's another layer for satellite, and so forth. But this is the one that, uh, that we're focusing on. And then if you look at um, service attributes for uh, these uh, types of uh, applications, um, we think the most important ones are probably uh, battery life, uh, transmit mode, message delivery, latency, scalability, uh, the data rate, geographic coverage, security, and device cost. Each of those need to be matched to the uh, application that uh, is being um, required, uh, so the connectivity requirement for uh, that application. And I have to say that I think that probably the, the three most important ones are, are most likely to be battery life, geographic coverage, uh, and device cost. And users need to decide the right compromise for them to achieve the cheapest and lowest power consuming connectivity service within the coverage requirement. 
So just a, a couple of quick examples here before I move on to um, uh, Brent at, uh, at Digi. Uh, we have water metering, so uh, application description there. You've got uh, remote monitoring of water meters. The core benefit is notification of leaks and minimized losses. The essential attributes are low latency, real-time connection, uh, essential for leak detection, um, up to 10 to 12 years battery life. The application-specific uh, attributes are high availability and good in-building and in-ground coverage. And the benefits using uh, low power wide area are, are basically fit and forget. Uh, it's there and it's always going to work due to long battery life and also to the superior in-building coverage. So that compares with you know, use of other types of technologies. Then we have home security alarms, for example. Uh, the application description is uh, backup connection for uh, home security uh, alarm systems. So when the uh, other uh, connectivity for a security alarm does not work for one reason or another. The core benefit is uh, property protection, of course. The essential attributes are uh, high availability network service, uh, greater than 10 years battery life expected with very low data rates. The um, particular issue here is that uh, some uh, traditional wireless, uh, cellular wireless uh, methods uh, can be jammed. Uh, whereas some of the low power wide area uh, options can't be jammed, or at least they can't be jammed in anything like the same sort of way. So there is uh, an, an opportunity there to make it um, uh, complementary. Now I'm going to um, uh, hand over now to, to Brent. So I'm going to um, move. All right. Well, thank you, Robin. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. So what I'm going to cover today, we we'll go through the agenda, is, is talk about cellular technology, both from historically how did the cellular, how, how did the roadmap for cellular technology progress, and then going into what's happening in the LTE roadmap and how some of the new standards that are coming out really fit in well with the, the low-power wireless that that Robin was talking about and really fit into the uh, the IoT application space and addressing some of those barriers to entry and then a little bit of a deeper dive into some of those IoT standards and benefits. So let's start historically. So historically this is who the carriers and the people who drove uh, cellular technology were driving their roadmap for. We'll, we'll just call her Molly. So, so Molly and her tablet were really the targets uh, of cellular technology. And what does Molly want? Molly wants more social networking. She wants faster downloads of her movies, and she wants more games. And what does that mean? That means more data, more speed, and uh, unfortunately more money probably for mom and dad who are paying the bill. And so really that's how the, uh, the cellular technology roadmap progressed, really starting with 2G, uh, which really the, the, the first time that, that voice and data were really linked and it was kind of the birth of, of a cellular machine to machine, all the way through 3G and 4G. Uh, very linear, each step along the way, the, the bandwidth increased with about a 10x increase along each step, uh, but also the cost increased. So that's not just a module cost and then device cost, but also a recurring cost. Um, now, on the consumer side, we, you know, everybody has really migrated along the, the way. I'm, I'm willing to bet that everybody on this call uh, has a 4G LTE Category 3 or Category 4 phone. Now, in the machine-to-machine -machine or, or now called IoT space, you know, we haven't necessarily seen that migration. Um, there's still devices out there that are running on 2G networks, and those 2G networks work perfectly. It's plenty of bandwidth for simple machine-to-machine -machine applications. Then we also see devices up to 4G where you do need that bandwidth, things like backhauling high-definition security cameras. So, so at an IoT perspective, you see devices in all three of these categories. Now, the issue with that is... As we know, especially those in the U.S. know, uh, 2G is nearing the end of life in a lot of places, especially in the U.S. Uh, as, as most of you know, AT&T is we're about two months away from their projected shutdown at the end of the year. Uh, so there's a lot of migration that has to go on in the m world. We also know as we look ahead that 3G is probably going away in the next five to seven years. We're starting to hear dates around 2021 uh, that 
that those networks might be starting to shut down. Um, so eventually, we know we're going to be left with just LTE. Um, now, the challenge with that is that, that, of course, when we think LTE, we think faster, we think expensive, we think not, not a good fit for machine to machine. So let's look at a comparison of the two different applications. So on the left, we bring back Molly. Um, on the right is, is a digi device. This is an M to M device that tracks liquid level in either tanks or in this specific case, we're tracking the level of, of water flowing into a, a sewage treatment plant to know if there might be flooding data. So really these are two extreme use cases, both using cellular technology. So in Molly's case, in the extreme case, she just used four gigabytes in one hour downloading a movie. That device on the right could run for a thousand years and it will not use that much data. Molly's battery lasts eight hours. Um, the device on the right, that battery has to last three years. And when Molly's tablet is dead, uh, she just walks over the wall and plugs it in. Now, for the people on the call, who wants to be the one who climbs down on that grate, overhangs that raw sewage, and changes the battery on that device? So um, three years really is the minimum. We want to see that get to five to ten years as the technology progresses. So all this really illustrates that a one-size solution does, doesn't work. LTE has to properly address both cases. Now, the good news for this is that cellular technology and, and the carriers and people driving that have seen this coming for a long time. They've seen the potential of the IoT world. They've seen the stats of 50 billion connected devices, and they've been shaping the technology uh, to, fit, to fit that. And what that's going to lead to is a fork in the road for the LTE roadmap. And what the fork in the road looks like is this. So where before on the previous slide you saw a very linear roadmap, what you're going to see is, is that roadmap is going to split. And on the left is what's generally called LTE advanced. And that's more traditional, the traditional roadmap, things getting faster and faster, more power, um, more bandwidth, lower latency, and more expensive. And that's really not going to be our focus of the talk today, but those are going to be the applications where you're connecting uh, high-definition security cameras, potentially providing Wi-Fi for customers in a, in a service shop or passengers on a, on a bus. Um, but what we're going to really focus is on the right side of that roadmap today, the low-power LTE initiatives from machine-to-machine -machine and Internet of Things. So the key attributes there are you're connecting very simple machines, you're connecting sensors, you don't need a lot of bandwidth, you need very, very little bandwidth to pass that sensor data. Uh, you might be deploying at thousands of locations, so the cost is very critical, not just the upfront cost of the device, but also any recurring costs with the cellular data plan, any solutions built on top of that. And they understand that these are very often in places where power is not available, where they have to run up a battery, potentially running off solar. Uh, so power becomes very critical on this side of the roadmap. Um, and I listed some target applications there, but Robin listed a lot as well. I mean, there, there's endless number of applications for things in the machine to machine and IoT space. So getting a little more technical, what does that look like? And for those of you familiar with LTE, you hear a lot, you hear a lot of CATS, uh, short for category, and that has to do with the different standards that are coming out that defines this technology. And again, you see on the LTE advanced side, uh, CAT 6, CAT 9, CAT 11, those really are all the same thing. You're getting faster and faster, more and more bandwidth and more expensive. Uh, but what we're going to focus on today is the right side of this roadmap again. Um, so where we're at today on that, uh, we've moved into the LTE Category 1 space. Uh, Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile have all launched and announced their networks. Now we've got two additional things on the roadmap, LTE CAT M1 and CAT NV1, standing for narrowband. Now this is a very U.S.-focused, uh, uh, U.S.-centric roadmap. This is not going to be this, the same roadmap globally, and I will talk about that later in the slide. Uh, but essentially, this is the path that we're going to see in the U.S. and probably mo most of North America on the machine-to-machine side. The other thing I want to note is you'll also hear a lot of discussion about narrowband. When people talk about narrowband LTE or narrowband IoT, um, that, when they're talking about that, they're talking about the CAT M1 and the CAT NB1. That's the first time we start narrowing that LTE band from the 20 megahertz channel width down to lower bands so that we can start simplifying the modules and bringing that cost down. 
Okay, so now a deeper dive into what those standards are. So, and Robin touched on this a little bit, uh, what we're doing is we're addressing all those barriers to entry to deploying IoT solutions and all the things getting us to the, preventing us today from getting to the 50 billion devices uh, that we need to address to get there. So, uh, mine are pretty similar to, uh, to what Robin said. So, really, we, gotta, we have to lower the device cost and we do that through reduced complexity cell modules. So that's narrowing the bands, reducing transmit power, that's gonna bring down the module cost and bring down the end device cost. Um, also recurring fees, obviously with cellular, there's always a recurring fee with the data plan. Uh, this is not so much a function of the technology as it is all the carriers understanding that, that there's a huge market here where the consumer market is saturated, the IoT market is wide open, uh, billions of devices waiting to be connected. The new technology and the competition among carriers is going to continue to bring those recurring fees down um, to the sub $1 a month per device range. Uh, battery life is also critical. Uh, these are often placed in areas where power is not accessible, as I mentioned, where they're running off solar potentially. Um, and we want to see that, as, as you saw, the device in the beginning lasting about two to three years. These new technologies will take you to five years to 10 years plus on a comparison basis based on the technology we have today. And lastly, coverage in remote areas. Everybody knows that IoT devices, they're often not in cities, they're in very remote areas where the coverage is not as strong. Um, these technologies will allow better coverage in those remote areas or in areas where coverage is difficult, such as in a basement, uh, and will lead to up to a 20 decibel improvement in link budget. So the first one on this on this roadmap is LTE CAT1, as I mentioned. This is the one that's here today. Uh, Verizon deployed their network in uh, announced their network in December of 2015. AT and T T-Mobile now have live CAT1 networks. Uh, this LTE CAT1 is going to have speeds similar to what you get with 3G today. So if 3G is sufficient for your application, LTE CAT1 is going to be sufficient for it. Um, the first of end devices are hitting the market now. Uh, from a module cost perspective, it's down in, in the 3G range. And with LTE CAT1, you're going to, in a fixed location, you can usually use one antenna, get a waiver from the carriers. If you're in a mobile application, then you still have a dual antenna requirement. Uh, so the real importance for LTE CAT1 is really that cost perspective. It's the first time that you would come out and get the longevity of LTE without worrying about pricing yourself or your solution out of the market. So it's bringing that competitive with 2G and 3G devices. So the next step along the line is LTE CAT M1. Uh, here we're dropping down to more equivalent of what were traditional 2G speeds at sub one megabyte uplink and downlink. And as I mentioned, this is the first time that that, that band starts to narrow from 20 megahertz down to 1.4 megahertz. So when you start hearing narrow band LTE, they're talking about these types of technologies. One of the big things that CADM1 is going to bring to the market is a new power saving mode. And, and that really has to do with how the device duty cycles, how often your battery power devices can sleep, without having to connect to the network. And that's where, this is where we're going to start to see 2 to 3x the, the life of the product based on battery. So extending from three years to five years, maybe even up to 10 years. Um, if you're watching this, you're, you're going to see, if you haven't already, you're going to start seeing a lot of PR about this. Verizon and AT&T in the U.S. are both doing uh, pilots right now and announcing them. They're really in a race to get this technology driving towards the middle of next year, having CAT M1 networks available with, I, I would predict, end device availability uh, mid to late 2017. So the last one on the roadmap is LTE CAT NB1, which is uh, narrowband. You'll also hear this called narrowband IoT. And here we're actually dropping below even what would be considered a 2G speed today. So sub 100 kilobytes uplink and downlink. So this is really for those very, very low data devices, simple things like a temperature sensor or a light sensor, sending very small amounts of data. Um, here, this is the bandwidth shrinks even more. Um, there's also going to be a, additional improvements in the power saving mode, so even longer battery life when we get to NB1. Uh, I would expect network support for this in the U.S. sometime around 2018. 
uh, and they're really driving to bring the module cost down with MB1. So driving to get that module cost below five dollars. Uh, not sure if, if if the technology will get there by the time it's deployed, but that's really what everybody's driving to uh, with this technology. Now, everything that I've kind of talked about of, of timing and everything has been very North America focused. If we look to other places in the world, it's not always going to follow the same map. Uh, in Europe, Vodafone and Telefonica are prioritizing NV1. Vodafone just did an announcement of the start of deployment of their NV1 network. And if we look to Australia and China, they are generally prioritizing NV1 over the CAT1 and CATM1. So those networks, the NV1 networks, will probably come online faster in Europe and Australia and China than they will in the U.S. Okay, quick summary. Uh, so the key takeaways from this is, is these new LTE standards, they're going to address the, bigger, the biggest barriers to entry to IoT. Um, and, you know, that's consistent with any wireless technology. So bringing down the device costs, bringing down the recurring costs, the 2x to 3x increase in your battery life, and improved coverage for remote areas. Uh, we also know 2G and 3G are going away in the U.S. and North America. It's time to migrate to LTE for long-term investment protection. Just moving to 3G is really just kicking the can not too far down the road. Um, and as these new standards coming out, understanding your bandwidth needs and right-sizing your LTE technology is going to be critical that you're getting the coverage and the bandwidth that you need at an economical price. Okay, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Alan for some exciting uh, conversation about Sigfox. Well, thank you, Brent. Thank you. It's uh, it's always great uh, to see all the great things uh, Digi's doing and the advancements in the uh, sort of conventional 3G PP world. But I'm going to talk about a second uh, what's going on in the new world of uh, low power wide area. And the nice thing is is that this is a business where one size does not fit all. And in fact, one size does not fit most, because IoT as an industry is not one thing. It's from a supplier side, we talk about IoT as this is big uh, skyscraper uh, we're going to. But, but from a customer, from an end user perspective, it doesn't exist. Um, what exists are specific problems uh, and specific solutions that are needed for those specific problems. And because there's such a wide range of these situations, we're going to see many technologies from a connectivity, from a data layer, and, and from a device side being applied. So my segment's called IoT in Action, Why You Need to Get Moving Now. So what I hope to do in the next 10 minutes is really just give you a sense of how fast things are moving and how the low power um, connectivity of the world may help you advance your business. So, so first of all, it, it's hard to really look at your email or open a newspaper at any given day about reading about something about IoT. And, in fact, IoT is so popular, we even were blamed for the massive security breach last week with the denial of service attack, uh, even though it really wasn't IoT. It was Internet-connected devices like routers and, uh, and cameras used to monitor your kids. So when manufacturers tend to put uh, passwords in like admin and users don't change them, um, these things happen. But, but that's how top of mind IoT is. And I think the reason IoT is so top of mind is people are realizing it is the biggest industry trend to hit in our lifetime. And it's very similar to what happened uh, over the past decade when all of a sudden the iPhone became popular and everything was I this and I that. Um, and then when the internet took off, everything was dot com. In fact, we still have things like that, like Salesforce.com that are uh, a legacy of that time. And you can actually tell from the name of when, uh, when they really were formed and took off. And we're seeing the exact same thing now, that everyone's trying to recategorize what they're doing as an IoT company. Um, because they see the power and the upside in the IoT business. And it's so exciting that everyone is competing to say how big the market is going to be. And so you see an incredible wide range of estimates coming from, from actually quite a few credible sources. And to have estimates distributed across s uh, such a wide range of numbers simply tells you that we're still in, a, in just emerging from an immature state of the business. And that's why you see this wide range of things. And, of course, the estimate I like the best is the John Chambers estimate, the former CEO of Cisco, who estimates a half a trillion connected things by the year 2025. Um, but more practically, when you look a little bit closer, the 2020, you can see there's really much less difference of, of what's going to happen 
in that amount of time. But I would argue it doesn't matter who's right. What only matters here is that the numbers are so big that you can't afford to not participate. You have to be considering how the world of IoT impacts your business from a competitive standpoint and how it enables your business from a revenue standpoint. So my old friend Archimedes, uh, one of the fathers of what we consider modern math, used to say, give me a place to stand in the lever and I will move the whole world. And I think of this quote, and I think of this perspective as we enter some of these new technologies like low power, um, wide area connectivity, because this is the lever that allows all kinds of assets, all kinds of devices, regardless of what they are, to finally fully participate in this IoT revolution. Because for all, as good as cellular technologies are, and they have a very important place, the operators have a very important place in the future, but the cost in the battery life really excludes them from a niche of billions and billions of things. They're frankly, um, Sigfox and Low Power Win in general was specifically created to address. And that's the lever we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail. That when you have billions and billions of things, there's not much challenge, frankly, if you have a million dollar earth moving machine or a caterpillar you're using to, to run your, uh, uh, your farm operation. Um, these kind of assets, it's a no brainer to put on a conventional 4G modem and collect those big gobs of data. But when we look at all the different sectors, all the verticals, and all the smaller things in the world that simply whisper rather than shout data, um, they don't need megabytes, and frankly, they don't need kilobytes. That agricultural sensor or that utility meter or many of these other things, your smoke detector, they really don't have that much to say. Now, what they say is incredibly valuable, but they can communicate that information with just simply a few bytes. And that provides an opportunity for incredible battery life and incredible cost savings that allow these devices to participate to then fundamentally change your business. So let me share a few statistics, and uh, a couple of these are from uh, some of the latest uh, business intelligence uh, work. But we tend, when we read some of those headlines, and in fact, again, last week with these, with these attacks, it's very easy to come up with the perception that IoT is about consumers. It's about um, getting everything in your house connected. And I think those are important things. They're exciting things. But frankly, they're a very, very small part of the IoT pie. And I brought this slide in just to show that if you look at the biggest uh, investments going on in IoT, it's really government and enterprise. It's not consumer. You're going to read more about consumer simply because, one, it's easy to write about. And two, the readership, it's easy to understand about. Not all of us have experience with industrial sensors, but everybody can appreciate a story about something in your house becoming connected. So that's the first thing I think it's really important to emphasize is that there are exciting consumer opportunities, but the more immediate opportunities, the larger opportunities are more non-consumer, industrial, and enterprise. And just another view of the kind of investment going on um, in the IoT space. You can certainly see it's a significant investment in the trillions of consumer, but you can see that the investment uh, on the non-consumer side actually significantly dwarfs um, the consumer space. And one more thing about consumer. I thought this was a really interesting graph about um, the difference in what you pay for a con conventional uh, dumb product, unconnected product in the consumer world, and what you pay for a connected product. And so if you're wondering when people talk about why OT isn't taking off, it is taking off actually in business and government. Now the consumer side, it's actually struggling because it's so expensive to internet enable, connectivity enable some of these things. Um, it's been holding back the, uh, uh, the pace of, uh, uh, of, of everything being deployed on the consumer side. So, so again, opportunities there. But if you're looking for the low-hanging fruit, um, you want to look towards the non-consumer side. So there's basically three reasons to deploy IoT. And then everything falls under one of these categories. And the first is cost efficiencies. You know, where's my stuff? Okay, how do I make it more efficient? I still remember 20 years ago when some of the first cellular data 
um, started coming out. And for the first time, you knew where some of your assets were, like trucks for the first, some of the time, for the first time. And all of a sudden, you needed 20% less of those things. And low-power IoT is about connecting things that you could never conceive of before. And this picture has, has lots of beautiful pallets in it, um, in addition to the forklifts. But there's things all around us, connecting every chair, connecting every smoke detector. Um, these are things being done right now that as the cost of the hardware and connectivity drops towards zero, it enables one to connect almost everything, things we never considered before. And by doing so, it enables you to get incredible cost efficiency. So the fancy way to say it is cost efficiencies, uh, but basically save money. The second big reason for getting going on IoT is really make money. It's the new revenue and business models. It's really an, that data stream enables you to turn every product into a service. And one of the announcements Sigfox has made, for instance, was um, uh, a million unit plus deal just to connect smoke detectors. And you might say, well, why in the world? What do you need to know from a smoke detector? How much is it going to say? Well, almost 25% of smoke detectors do not work when a fire goes off. And what if that thing ran a self-test on the battery and on the sensors every day and transmitted that? And that if for some reason that device wasn't working or many other devices you have in your home, a new one simply showed up on your doorstep. So now instead of selling a physical piece of hardware, the hardware is simply something that enables a reoccurring monthly revenue stream providing smoke detection as a service. And it's a very simple concept, but you can now take this and you can apply this concept to just about everything that has a microprocessor in it. So we're seeing incredibly creative new business models being driven by the data that is for the first time in history can be unlocked by low power connectivity solutions. So save money, make money. And the third one is regulatory compliance. Um, in smart cities, but also in many other areas, um, we all know, especially during this, uh, this challenging political season, um, one of the topics we were reminded of are about regulatory at a local level, at a state level, at a federal level. Um, I was in a meeting uh, not too long ago. The CEO of a company was telling me about the federal rules required if you run a preschool, even to make sure certain things happen every month that it's really difficult to track. Um, we're seeing this uh, in smart cities. We're seeing this in schools. We're seeing this in lots of safety applications. And again, the problem with this is that traditionally you have some guy walk around with a clipboard for some of these compliance things, and hopefully he wasn't sitting at home watching cartoons and that he actually went to the place, measured the thing they're supposed to measure, um, and brought the correct data back. Um, with the world of low-power wind, you don't have to wonder if it's being done. It simply happens because it's cost-effective to do so, and you know exactly what you're getting. So these three reasons, in the end, drive just about every IoT activity going on out there right now. So just to give you some sense of how low power fits compared to some other technologies, um, again, is 3GPP, and they try to come down from 4G to 3G to, to M to narrowband. You're still looking at models from what we've seen, even in narrowband, at the $7 to $10 range. Um, where Sigfox is, quite frankly, already under $2 for modules. And the trade-off is you don't get as much data. You're going to get data with these more traditional technologies that you'll never get with a low-power solution like us. But for billions of things, you don't need it. You know, how much data do you need for your washer or dryer to say, I'm broken, this is what's wrong, come fix me. My trash can is full, come pick me up now and save 30% on your smart city costs. So the message on this slide is that the world is going to be a messy place. Most companies will need a variety of connectivity solutions because the use cases are so wide-ranging and there's a place for everything. And the trick is, is to not start with a technology and try to apply it, but rather focus on the problem you're trying to solve and then decide what technologies you need to solve that problem. So um, one of the things we talk about a lot is, again, the characteristics of LP WAN around energy efficiency. You know, we're currently doing um, SLAs now in excess of a dozen years on battery life because of the way it's designed for that purpose. Being able to roam globally, no activation, and again, costs approaching a dollar a year based on the amount of messaging going on. It enables a whole new set of use cases. So in the interest of time, I'll just quickly finish up with these last uh, two slides here or so. But when you look at 
a wide variety of assets you would never consider connecting. Um, it's amazing how many billions of these little, tiny, small assets. I mean, you think about just something as simple as leak prevention um, in a home, um, knowing if your water heater or pipes are leaking. You can't imagine the amount of interest the insurance companies have of knowing when that happens uh, in real time. And it's not just someone who owns a vacation house. Um, of knowing exactly when an animal is inoculated, exactly where that happens. Um, think of that as medicine as a service, where you're only paying for each shot. Or we're working with partners right now um, around the U.S. and Europe that what if you could deploy thousands of really inexpensive sensors that last for a decade or 15 years that can sense early warnings of when a forest fire starts in these remote areas, and you could attack it um, before it becomes a terrible problem. These technologies fundamentally change the way we look at these problems. And the other thing I'll add is that they don't always have to work alone. We're finding about half our deployments are actually, with our technology, partnered with cellular or Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or something else. And you use one technology, like low power, for what it's good for perhaps most of the time, but when you need that fat pipe to do a firmware upgrade or something more significant with data, you can actually use low power as a control channel and just use what you need for the fat pipe and then turn it off when you don't need it. So there's actually quite a bit of opportunity for these technologies to be deployed together using each one for its best and highest use. Um, just to give you some sense of how quickly things are deploying, we're over two dozen countries right now covering over 360 million people. By the end of the year, we'll be covering in over 30 countries. So when we talk about um, low power uh, being available, um, it's actually rolling out really quickly around the world. Uh, so it's not a future. It's something that's really here today in many places. And I would leave you with a very traditional innovation adoption curve chart with one addition. And that we're used to seeing this sort of curve where you have a few innovators and it starts to scale up with more people becoming early adopters and early majority and so on. And things like low power, WAN, connections, so fundamentally changes your business case for so many different um, verticals that we're seeing people really jumping into a higher level much earlier. And these are the people that will capture unfair revenue, unfair profit, and frankly, unfair market share by changing the game in their industry. And we're, we're going to see an incredible amount of this activity. We're working with many of these people. And I would suggest to you that 2017 is a true tipping point, that the people that are earlier to embrace this and apply this to their own challenges are going to be the early profiteers in their segments. So thank you. Thank you, Alan, and uh, also Brent for uh, those uh, really uh, interesting slides. We have uh, quite a few questions uh, in, so we'll start with those. And uh, do please keep them coming in. Um, I think I'd like to, it's not necessarily in order here of when they came in, but uh, there was one question here which uh, came up while you, Alan, were, were talking just now. When you started talking about uh, the cost of, uh, of modules and so forth, the, um, the cost to retrofit for houses could be similar. Why not use Wi-Fi or beacons within the house, which is then connected back to cellular network? What are Alan's thoughts uh, on Sigfox winning in this domain? Do you have a, a thought about that, Alan? Yeah, we actually um, get calls from those people who've been trying to use Wi-Fi in the home for the last couple of years. Because at one point, everyone thought that everything in the home is just going to be Wi-Fi. And you basically have the problem that happens when your 80-year-old mother calls you, which has happened to me, and tells you the Internet is broken. And then you have to explain to your 80-year-old mother how, what IPv6 is and what MAC address and those fun things. And so... There's a couple of problems with Wi-Fi. It has this application, and, and people have actually tried it pretty extensively, even in higher price things like white goods, less expensive items in the house. And there's a couple of problems with it. First of all, if it's not a powered device, you run into massive battery issues. Um, but second of all, even if it is a powered device, what the research has showed is after one year, as much as 75% of Wi-Fi connected devices do not remain connected because your access point burps at some time and you have to reset everything. Um, there's configuration issues because um, you're depending upon users to actually set it up and make the connection. Everything, for instance, from Sigfox is actually pre-activated, pre-provisioned. There's zero user um, action taken for the thing to work. It simply works. And when you take that, you know, you can't get scale depending on millions or billions of users to actually do something. It, we, 
we found that it doesn't scale. So I think Wi-Fi certainly has a place, but for many things, um, people have been trying this for the last couple of years, and frankly, it just it doesn't work for many applications because of those characteristics. Oh, okay, all right, that's great. Um, so uh, another question, which is um, for both of you, is uh, are the new IoT 4G standard a competitor to Sigfox? Brent, do you want to start with that one? Um, yeah, I can start with that. And, and no, I don't. I don't see them as a competitor. Um, they're both kind of going for that those 50 billion, or uh, I guess the 500 billion, as Alan uh, mentioned. That huge market, and there's not going to be a one size fits all. Um, the, the technologies are close, but but actually, I think Alan's slide perfectly showed it. There's going to be applications where where narrowband IoT uh, or uh, LTE is required. Uh, based on that can be supported for the cost and the bandwidth, and there's going to be places where Sigflox and other LPWA standards are going to be the best fit. Yeah, there's, there's no question. In fact, I was on a panel at an industry event on Tuesday with um, uh, one of the key product managers for IoT for AT&T, and we had the same conversation. Um, uh, you know, where uh, frankly, it's extremely complimentary because remember, at the end of the day, we're supporting 12 byte data payload. Well, bytes, not kilobytes, not megabytes, and there's billions of things that need, that's all they need, but there's lots of things that need more data than that, and that's not our space. So, so we're really looking at Sigfox is, you know, almost no overlap with traditional 3GPP stuff, cellular stuff, and, uh, but frankly, we're really addressing a completely unserved market, things that want to participate in IoT, but simply have been excluded by the state of the technology. Yes. Um, do you see low power wide area as being suitable for telematics applications? So for monitoring items that are on the move, like vehicles. Who would like to take that? It, it, it's it's less than a, it's less of an issue that it's on the move. It's more of an issue of the amount of data. So okay. if you're looking to ping an asset as a backup location service, I think uh, LP WAN is great. I think when you start getting into a constant flow of data coming out of there, you better call Digi. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's all driven by the amount of data, not by the mobility. Right. Brent, do you have a thought to that? Um, well, I mean, you know, tracking of vehicles was really how machine to machine was born, in my opinion, was, was the army of, uh, of simple trackers with GPS and cellular. So that, that's always been a, a good fit for cellular, and that, that's really not going to change in the future. No, that's fair enough. Okay. All right. Um, th th this, uh, I'm not sure whether, just how relevant this is, but uh, it was one of the questions, so I'll ask you it. It is, uh, what are Sigfox and Digi doing to implement eSIM technology and remote provisioning with regards to 4G, LTE, and NB-IoT? I think that's more of a question for you, Brent, rather than for... Uh, uh, for Alan, but uh, Alan, you may have a thought about it uh, in a sort of parallel sense. Well, m my answer is a 10-second answer in that we don't have sins. Uh, everything is deactivated, <laughs> pre-provisioning, so we've, we've eliminated that issue, so uh, we can check mark that one, so uh, Brent. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. What, do you, what, do you, what would you like to say about that? Uh, yeah, the, the world is definitely moving to e-SIMs, uh, especially in the industrial IoT space. Um, you know, there's all kinds of problems using the plastic sims, especially if you, if you get into industrial environments, they warp, they get lost, they get stolen. Uh, certainly e-sims where, where it's mounted directly to the board is a better solution in the future. Um, the, the technology is there. Uh, you know, what, what we would like is the companies have an e-sim where I can program it to work, work on any carrier in the world, just send it a command and say, okay, well, now I'm in, now I'm in Europe, so make me Vodafone. Okay, now I'm in California, so I want to be AT&T. Uh, the technology can do that. The carriers are, are a bit resistant to to enabling that because they, they don't necessarily want people to instantly be able to switch uh, from one network to another. When they have a customer, they want to keep them. Uh, so, so where we're at today is, is multiple eSIMs on products that allows you to switch uh, in between multiple carriers. In the future, it may the technology may exist, or excuse me, the, the ability may be exist to switch really to any carrier by using a single eSIM, but that, that's not available today. Yeah, the technology, I mean, the technology has actually been around for a while, and it's more of a mobile industry issue than an IoT issue, but you're absolutely right, Brent. I mean, the, the operators, you view it as a control point, and it's been very reluctant 
um, to resist. I'll just say, though, since at Sigfox we use any sub-gigahertz modem pretty much works for us. So we actually um, uh, often, I mean, multi-million unit volume get downloaded onto something already deployed using a, a faster piece of connectivity um, and simply hop on the existing sub-gigahertz modem, and frankly, uh, it's Sigfox enabled. So. Um, we don't really have those kind of boundaries. It's just if you have a sub gigahertz modem, a new or existing, we'll work on it. Very good. Okay. Uh, so, Alan, this is really uh, something for specifically for you. It's uh, which use cases can Sigfox address which NB-IoT cannot address? Quite a few. So, again, NB-IoT, it's, it's a couple years away, um, and, and Brent should comment on this too because he might have a different opinion. Um, but, but again, NB-IoT is a couple years away, and the, the earliest module class is going to be 7 to 10. So first of all, they're going to handle more data than a, than a Sigfox. Um, but the trade-off is our module price today, today you can buy it, less than $2 a module. And, and frankly, because it's a 3GPP technology, I would argue that our module cost is probably lower than the IP cost, intellectual property cost that's built into that product because of all the cross-licensing that has to happen in that world. So it, it's, um, it's, again, things that don't need that level of data. Um, we need a really low-cost option for both connectivity. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like I, I tell the story, uh, Robin, of you know, Nordstrom's might wake up one day and decide they're going to jump down a level and open up something that compete with Macy's. They're not going to be the dollar store. You know, in, in some ways, we're sort of the dollar store of connectivity. There's, there's billions of people who want to go in there and shop, but it's not really going to compete with Macy's or Nordstrom's, and they're trying to go from Nordstrom's to Macy's in my mind. So it has its place, but we're really yeah. doing something that's a level below it in terms of cost, in terms of data, uh, and in terms of availability. Yeah, so I think that there's a, been a traditional view that uh, all of these technologies are, are essentially competing against each other, but uh, I think you're, you're really stating the case that they're complementary and they go for uh, different parts of the market for different applications. And it's more a case that we, we need to think more about the applications that uh, become available through all of these connectivity alternatives. Yeah, and Robin, I'll, I'll, I'll just share with you, you know, years ago when we started putting Wi-Fi in phones and I was in front of uh, SVPs at Tier 1 operators in the U.S. Um, talking about new devices with Wi-Fi, and they'd look at me and they'd start swearing at me about why the heck would they ever put a competing connectivity technology with a phone. And nine months later, every phone had Wi-Fi on it. So there's, a, there's an emotional response with some of these things sometimes, that any connectivity is a competitor, and then it tends to settle out pretty quickly in terms of um, where everybody fits in the topology. And that's why we actually have multiple Tier 1 operators like Telefonica is actually investors in Sigbox because they see, frankly, yeah, there's a place for us in a certain area, and there's a place for the 3GPP stuff in a different area. And frankly, there's there's use cases for everybody. Yeah, I think I think that's right, actually. I, I'm just going to ask one more question. We've probably got time for this, uh, uh, which is, is also a sort of one versus the other, but I think the answers could be somewhat different. Uh, security is one of the biggest concerns in the IoT space, and there are multiple standards which are out there. Who will be the winner, and which network will be more secure, NB-IoT or LP-WAN networks like LoRa or Sigfox? I think this is more a case of the alternative approaches to security and, uh, and, and how that responds to uh, or correlates to different types of applications. But uh, uh, Alan, would you like to start and then Brent to, to, to uh, finish that off? Sure. Um, and I can go a couple minutes over if we, if we have to. but. Um, it's pretty simple that um, uh, there's so many different use cases and security is going to take different forms for different use cases. And it's, about, it's based upon what people want to pay. So we certainly have a pretty, you have to have a, a foundational level of security, which we certainly have very strong. The nature of our devices, though, is there's no constant handshake between the device and the network. So our devices aren't even connected to the network 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, that combined with the encryption, combined with there's a different level of security uh, beyond the foundational level. People will pay for, for instance, a, a uh, agricultural sensor versus the vice president's pacemaker to go to the extreme. And so, again, I think it's everything has to have a robust level of security, but how far you go above that really depends upon the sensitivity of the use case. 
Yeah. Brent, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I think uh, when you look at the time, I mean, the question, part of the question was who will be the winner? Well, I, I don't think there's a, there's a winner when, it, there's going to be one technology that's going to be a winner when it comes to security. I mean, if you look at it from a security aspect, um, we're all winners by making sure all of these, these different uh, uh, wireless standards are secure, um, just given the sensitivity to uh, some of the data that they'll be holding and the disruption that can be caused when there's security leaks. I mean, I generally, when, when I think of where the security risks are, uh, it, it's typically at the device level and then at the enterprise level. And when you see not so much in the actual transportation of data, because th that that data can be encrypted, um, so that it, you know, for, in most cases can be not be hacked. When you see most of these security breaches, it's because either somebody didn't implement the proper security at the device level or somebody had maybe had weak passwords at the enterprise level. It's not so much, um, and those are really the vulnerabilities that people attack. I mean, the, the days where you buy a device and it comes with a default password of admin, admin are over. Um, you know, it's, we're, we're no longer waiting for, hoping that a customer, giving the customer the ability to implement uh, the correct security and hoping they do it correctly. Um, the, that's going to be really the big change going forward, and it makes it more difficult for customers. But uh, co devices are going to come pre-secured so that uh, uh, a customer not implementing correctly doesn't open up the entire network for attack. That's great. Okay. All right. Well, thanks very much. We're almost out of time. But before we go, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us. We really appreciate the time you spent with us. Uh, and now I'm going to hand over to uh, David at uh, the end to end zone team for some uh, important information. On behalf of the end to end zone, thank you, Robin, Brent, and Alan. And thank you all for joining us today.